Welcome to Squirrel, the podcast for distracted writers, hosted by Candace J. Thomas and Jody L. Milner. Welcome to Squirrel, everyone. This is Candace. And I'm Jody. And this week is episode 39. And we are in April, which is National <laughs> Poetry Month. I almost said n- novel writing because we did a no, November that, one. Nope. National Poetry Month. And I wanted to kind of just talk about poetry, just give a nod to it and what our thoughts are on poets and poetry and writing prose and all that good stuff. So, so clearly you care about this month. I do. I can call myself a poet for sure. You do, you have a published book of poetry. Yes. As a poet, when you do readings, you have to have one. You, that's how you make money. <laughs> that's how you don't, you don't, as a poet, you don't make money any other way. And we have history to prove that point. So anyway, yeah. What are your thoughts on poetry? I'm actually, I'm super thrilled that poetry gets a dedicated month because otherwise most people would be like, poetry, who's she? Like, <laughs> I don't think anyone would stop and be like, oh yeah, when was the last time I appreciated poetry? Like they just wouldn't think of it at all. But as, so, yeah. As poets, we recognize this month and we glorify, like we yeah, really it's celebrate a big thing. it. So there's lots of things happening around the state, around my state, around the nation with different readings. Like there's stuff on YouTube. There's events that you can go to. Would you like to give us a bit of a history? Yeah, on sure. National Poetry Month. Yeah, I got this from poets.org because there is a thing called poets.org that sums up everything and you can find all of anyone's favorite poems or your least favorite poems or any kind of one that needs to express any kind of style that you're looking for. It's got everything. So it was launched by the Academy of American Poets in April of 1996. Do you remember what you were doing in 96? I I do. in high school. (laughs) (laughs) It was a, so National Poetry Month is a special occasion that celebrates poets' integral role in our culture and that poetry matters. Over the years, it has become the largest literary celebration in the world. With tens of millions of readers, students, they celebrate this in in, uh, schools, uh, librarians, as I said, booksellers, literary events, everything. So it's marking poetry's important place in our lives. And poetry, I want to add, is not just a, I mean, you can create a poem, but as a poetic writer, you can always bring in your poetic voice into the prose that you write, into your fiction as well. And a lot of authors do that. They write poetically. So it's not just, you know, poem, but it's also a thing, a writing, you know, thing. So what about, what are your thoughts? What are my thoughts on National Poetry Month? Mm. I I just love that there's a dedicated month where we can celebrate it because like even for people who don't write it much, I think poems are powerful. And I think there are phrases from poems that have become an ingrained part of the culture and people don't even realize that this came from poetry. I, I be, believe we'll get into a little bit of that later. Yeah, the there I feel that there is a... I don't know, a taint to the word poem. Like there is poems make people uncomfortable. Why do you think that people are uncomfortable with poetry? I mean, the only explanation I can think of is that poetry is up there with writing essays. Like people's exposure to poetry, it was when they were in school and they were required to write some sort of awkward poetry and then read it in front of the class and receive like harsh or critical feedback on it. I think as a nation, most people's experience with poetry is feeling awkward, scared, or humiliated. Because poetry because really is an emotional Because their experience with it yeah. was was that. They were forced to make something and then they were forced to somehow bare their soul a little bit and then get weird feedback on it. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people feel uncomfortable with poetry because their initial experiences with it weren't terribly positive. And only people who have either had positive experiences early or later discovered the beauty of it and then it unlocked something within them. That's when we have people be like, dude, I love poetry and I want to dive into it. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that poetry is kind of a running joke, you know, bad poetry. I should I should state. So like with the with the Vogon poetry uh, Mm -hmm. reading from 
Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, man. Uh, I thought that was... Poetry is torture. (laughs) Right? It was just one of the funniest moments in the entire book because we all know those, like, we dread the bad poetry. We dread it. But I think bad poetry always... We always need bad poetry to make it better poetry. I feel that every poet was once bad. So it's a it's a learned skill set that you need to, you know, enhance and improve and learn more about. So moving from having this idea like people do have this weird bad connotation with poetry, like what is your level of comfort with poetry? I love it. Poetry comes easy to me because I have a very poetic voice in my writing. And I use poetry as a writing exercise in order to improve my voice. And so because I activate that muscle of creativity, it shows in my work and it can read more ethereal or poetic or because I just learned that skill set. A lot of poetry really is learning the skills that you need in order to make your words important or mean something to people. So I think when you do a good structured poem, uh, not just free form, a lot of people like free form and just dump out their brain and that's great. But doing a structured form of poetry really makes your brain activate in different ways because you have to be concise and you have to be specific to what that form, what that structure is. So it improves your voice. Then that when you write fiction, that just, it comes more natural to you as as part of your voice. What about you? So I love the idea of poetry. <laughs> um, I do get caught up in the rules because there are a lot of forms that have extremely rigid rules about, you know, how you need to do the certain amount of beats and the rhyming structure. Like there, there is lots of poetry that has lots of rules and I'm not mm-hmm. comfortable with the rules. And if I'm not comfortable with a rule set, then I avoid it. Yeah. Um, but the few times form, you don't need to worry about that. Yeah. You can just dump your brain, which is nice. So I've, I have tried several different things uh, in the past. Like this was really random, but I was driving home and there was this really intense shooting star that arced right across in the direction I was driving. Mm -hmm. And the second I saw it, a poem struck me between the eyes. It was crazy. It had nothing to do with a shooting star. It was a horror poem about the clicker clack man. Um, (laughs) And I wrote that thing in 15 minutes and I thought it was amazing. And I sent it in to some random call and I have a published poem in an anthology. Congratulations. It's a horror horror poem. (laughs) Um, And that was like, sometimes the words come easy. Sometimes it just makes sense. And it was, I mean, that one was a bit Dr. Seussian, like a bit up, like it was weird. Mm-hmm. But I did a free form slam poetry thing once like I was writing down and I was doing some very raw emotions there. I turned that one into a contest just for fun. And whoever judged it, they personally didn't like my theme. My uh-huh. theme offended them personally and they marked me down for that. Yeah. Which that's the problem with poetry, I man. get so annoyed with because mm-hmm. I'm like, you're not supposed to judge on your personal feelings yeah. about this poem. You're supposed to judge on if it has impact for the audience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I was super annoyed at that because I did pour in a lot of stuff into that. And I don't consider myself an awful writer. Like, I feel like I, I pulled it off. I feel like it was effective. And then that was the only feedback. One sentence. I really didn't like your use of this imagery because I don't think... That that's not really good feedback. Like, it doesn't help you enhance your no, poetry or even you, you go didn't into the like, specifics of what of you didn't like what my metaphor. You could do yeah, it's a metaphor. Uh, so that's sorry. what metaphors are supposed to do. I'm so sorry about that. That's so that's so lame. So um, it just it makes me want to stick to fiction because I feel that the barriers for entry might be lower. Where you have more words, therefore less judgment per word. Mm-hmm. Poets and people who call themselves poets are very specific about their ideas of poetry. And that's true. They're going to have a lot of opinions because I don't know. I think often about poems like or poets back in the glory days of, of England or something or in Gothic Poe or Shelley or, you know, those those type of poems during that time where they were just super arrogant about their poems and about them being a poet in these dramatic ways and whatever. So I can see why 
I think that that is still a stigma that comes down from from Whitman and from you know the well, and there's almost an implied uppityness. Yeah, people are, can be very they can clutch their pearls quite tightly when it comes to poetry. Yeah. Well, and it's a personal thing. It's very personal to pour out your heart. And so when somebody says, yeah, I don't like this, then it's there's a sliver going into your heart because you pulled that one out of there. It's a piece, a horcrux of you that is now on paper and somebody has, has ripped it to shreds and now it just hurts. I get that. But let's talk about poems that have affected you or poets that have affected you in some way. Let's talk about good things. <laughs> Let's, some positiveness. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not saying that any of those old poets are bad. They're lovely. The poems themselves have, have really affected my life. I won't, I won't say that they haven't. Like Frost has, definitely. What do you think? What are some poems? Like that poems po that have personally affected me? Well, I grew up in a household where my dad would randomly recite these little clippets of poems and he would never attribute them. Like I didn't know where they were from. So sometimes it was a Robert Frost. I learned that later. And there was one from a Rudyard Kipling that kept coming up. And I think it was when he was feeling a bit self-righteous and pious, but he would, he would say it and the line still sticks in my head. He would say, the tumult and the shouting dies, the captains and the kings depart. Still sands thine ancient sacrifice and humble and contrite heart. That's from Recessional by Rudyard Kipling. Like that still sticks in my mind. And I probably always will. And every time I hear that, I'm probably going to think of my dad. That's amazing. That's awesome. My dad did never <laughs> recite poetry to us. But my dad had the equivalent of a British boy um, education because he did his high schooling in Australia. Oh. And oh, cool. they they have a much stronger literary I feel they lean into classic literature far more than we would get in an American school. That's okay. That's true. I don't know uh I don't know how schools manage poetry now, honestly. I think uh, they have like a singular unit once a year in most English maybe classes. In April, let's hope. And it's <laughs> like this is what poetry is. Here are some of the standard forms. Now write a poem. Good luck. Mm -hmm. I, I have so many. I have so many. There's a Dickinson poem that I can't re I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm so sorry, everyone. I'll put this is my episode, so I'll put all of this in the blog. Uh Dylan Thomas. Let's see, what what did I call it again? <laughs> now now that I can't remember the do not go gentle into that dark night. No. Good, good night. night. That good night. Anything from Shel Silverstein, I want to add. Like, I loved every single book that he ever wrote. And he's an amazing poet. There's one from Elizabeth Akers Allen called Rock Me to Sleep. That one is lovely. And the um, Amanda Gorman speech from Biden's inauguration. Oh, wow, I found that amazing. That was just jaw dropping, you know? Okay, I'll stop. So there you go. There's There's some that have affected me personally anyway. Do you use poems in your, or poetry in your writing? Actual poems? No. You don't? No, I don't put actual poems in any of my prose. Never have, probably never will. I do like poetic writing, though. I really like literary devices. I like doing things that are impactful so that the prose has more poeticness and more power to it. Mm -hmm. So I will do that, but I won't actually put poems in there. You'll find poems in every single thing that I've ever written. <laughs> I swear, I have poems everywhere. I find, so it was my second book when, with the publisher and I had written a poem and put it in the beginning of the book and the editor-in-chief, Penny, she's like, where did you get this poem because we want to attribute it to the poet and I was like oh it's me did you did you think it was somebody else that made me feel so good that no it was actually I wrote that thank you very much and Everstar starts out with a poem on every single section I I love adding because because the poems in my fantasy series are part of the mythology so it's a good way of oral storytelling, you know, an oral history. When you put a event that is depicted in some kind of poem, that people were going to remember it because of the different devices that it uses, the rhymes that it uses, the alliteration. That was how they told stories back in the olden days. So when I put it in my mythology, in my series, that was one that was really in, important. 
to add. And that's why I have poems in my fantasy series. So yeah, if you write fantasy, that might be a good way to talk about it. Yeah. So you, you're going to have feelings about me saying that if there's a poem that appears in a book, I generally skip it. I don't care. That's your fault for missing the reading. You know, if it was elvish poetry that doesn't make any sense, I do skip that because I don't read elvish, you know, but that's your own fault as the reader because you're missing that history that I'm giving you. Well, and most of the times when I run into poems in works and I will read through it, I'm just like, that's nice. They sang a song. And I'm like, I don't see how this fits. Like when I can't see that connection into the mythos and into the world, besides it just being a nice little bit of poetry in there. There's been too many times where it's just been, let's add this random song in the middle of the book. I'm like, I don't know where this is going. <laughs> I don't know those books. <laughs> so <laughs> everything I did was intentional. And I think that the fantasy that I have read that has poems or songs uh, tend to have some kind of intention for it. But I mean, it's very possible, you know, remember anything specifically. But yeah, I guess that's your own fault if you don't read it. And if other people skip it in my series, that's fine. But you miss a key element of the entire plot because there's secrets. There's like little clues into what is going to happen uh, because of the histories that are told by these people. It's your own fault, man. There you go. <laughs> fine then. What do you think about... uh? slam poetry because I have I call myself a poet but I can't do slam and slam poetry is really popular right now it's you can find lots of stuff on YouTube they have slam sessions slam poetry nights at different coffee houses there's competitions that different colleges have with these slam poets it's an interesting art form to do slam poetry because it's extremely emotional and it always has this really big build to this saying this and then bring it into a point and it always makes me feel weird <laughs> it, like in uncomfortable with a lot of the things that I think that's their idea is they got and I this is a very general I'm just saying this very generally that as I witness slam poetry in certain aspects of it they have made me feel uncomfortable because they want to make people feel uncomfortable they want to people to think differently than they usually do with this or that or consider this what's happening here or how I evolved here and the tragedy of this or that. They're wanting that emotional response from you. And if that's their intention, they're it's winning. It's working. I feel gutted or I feel bad or but I in my poetry, I don't like to make people feel that way. There's no uh, specific agenda that I'm trying to achieve. I, in my poetry, there are, it's emotional, but it's meant as a healing device instead of a trigger. And that's where I have a hard time with slam poetry <laughs> because I just, I can't, I can't do it. I can't go into that art form and make people feel those things, you know? What are your thoughts? I think slam poetry is it's very performative. Like you can read a piece of it and it'll have like, it'll have one kind of impact, but watching one be performed um, is very, very different. It, it is, it is aggressive and it is in your face and it is meant to make you feel exactly like you said. And I can appreciate that as a form of intense emotional communication. And so do I seek it out? No. Do I see it and be like, wow, that person put exactly what was going on and what was going on in their head and in their hearts and they were able to put it into words and use those words to communicate and i feel that that's powerful and should be respected mm -hmm. is the intention to cause pain and unrest and discomfort in the audience some of it yeah but at the other time it's also this cry to be understood mm -hmm. And so I I resonate a lot with cries to be understood just with a neurodivergent background where not being understood was one of my biggest frustrations growing up where I'm trying to tell people things that are so, so clear in my mind and I, I don't have the the right way of communicating it to them and they brush it off. It's something that's like deeply important to me and I'm trying to get people to listen and they're brushing it off and they're brushing it off and they're brushing it off, which is part of the reason I wanted to become an, like a writer and an author mm -hmm. was to be able to communicate clearly and powerfully. 
And so I have a lot of respect for the slam poets that create these pieces and they bring it to a stage and they perform it and they make you feel something and it makes this impact, even if it's uncomfortable. I wish I, I, in some ways I wish I could do it, but I can't, like, I, I don't have that in me. So there is hats off to anyone who can perform that because I can't, it's just too, it's too emotional. It's just too, too much of vulnerability how about that it is Probably. it is very vulnerable what about music i but do find mus- lyrics it's to my be- favorite form of poetry if we can count it and i am counting it there are music lyrics and there are songs that are so amazingly crafted and i always think on imagine dragons lyrics how they have these very intricate fast delivered very clear messages that they're sending so if you pay attention to it it's like wow Mm -hmm. that is so cool uh we're just we're watching arcane and the opening sequence goes to the song enemy and it's brilliant the writing in the song enemy is brilliant yeah i agree and you know did you know that uh radioactive was written for the spider-man musical you probably didn't know that did you (laughs) it totally (laughs) makes sense i could see that he did it yeah then it went they you know youtube oh it went viral so fast Oh, yeah. I respect any musician that can put as a lyricist and they can put it to music and it makes you feel incredible. Oh, geez. Yeah, I there's a band called Elbow and the lead singer, his name is Guy Garvey, and everything he writes is super beautiful and poetic. And I it always makes me feel stuff. And I love it. I just love it. But yeah, if your lyrics make sense and you have a good if you have like a good guitar, 12 string probably, and piano, <laughs> dude, I'm forever. I, I'm right there. <laughs> I totally love it. And the, but the lyrics, I always listen to lyrics. I'm always looking for deep lyrics, you know. I'm going to have to, I haven't watched Arcane for a while. It's been, I'm going to have to I am, it, I am it. itching for the next season to come out only because <sighs> the story must go on. Yeah, it's it was just so powerful. Okay, wow, we really scrolled there. Sorry about that. Uh, so, I think if you are interested in in National Poetry Month and maybe trying to find some sources of where to publish or where to perform, there's always open poetry nights at different colleges if you're if you're uh, that age, and at different coffee houses. There's always something happening around me. Uh, you can go also to, I'm going to suggest Button Poetry. Excellent, because, excellent resource. Yeah. And I met them at the IBPA conference. They were delightful people. Uh, they have all of these amazing resources of where you can publish, how you can find your community on YouTube or on Instagram. They're just super helpful and awesome. And look up that Button Poetry. Do you have any Um, I'm just going to lean on your experience here only because that's not a world I am deeply a part of. (laughs) But I know you can find open calls online. There's contests uh, abounding everywhere. I do urge people to be careful uh, where you submit. This is just common caution. Yeah. Uh, If you need a reminder on what to look for, we have a contest episode. Um, And I will find that link. (laughs) We'll link it it in in the doobly-doo. Yeah, it sounds good. Any final thoughts? You know... Since I'm not someone who tends to lean towards writing a lot of poetry, if it's from a bad experience or whatever, I do urge people to to try just because it does unlock parts of your brain that you might not have used for your writing before. And it opens opportunities for better ways of communicating. So I think learning more about poetry and playing with it can only improve your writing. Yeah. So try a haiku. Or a limerick. Um, <laughs> just have fun with it. See what pops out. I love that. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally with Jody. Just just try it and see what it, it does. I find poetry, it, I use it a lot, as I said, for healing. I need to sometimes dump what's in my brain and in my heart onto paper so that I don't need to carry it around anymore. And I think a lot of poets actually do that as well. And we'll keep it and treasure it in a different place so that we don't have to activate all those feelings. So anyway, yeah, I'm I'm really glad we did this episode. Yay. Happy National Poetry <laughs> Month. Happy Poetry Month. And yeah, well, I'll, I'll definitely put some of my favorite poems and links to 
to it in the blog and so that you can find out what we're actually talking about. And some of the things that we missed, like I couldn't remember exactly which poem it was that <laughs> Dickinson had, but we'll link that all into the blog. So anyway, what do we got next episode? Well, we are going to follow up this conversation with a specific episode on using this poetic language in <laughs> prose. <laughs> I think you need that right now. I definitely do. My <laughs> words are not turning on properly. Uh, using poetic language in prose. So we're going to talk more about literary devices and things you can do to improve your prose using some poetic techniques. I love this idea. I'm so I could, excited. I could talk about this all the time. So perfect. I can't wait. All right. A huge thank you for listening. Remember, we have a Patreon and a bias a coffee. If we said anything today that you're like, that's awesome. Yeah compensate us appropriately yeah and find everything like go to our blog subscribe to our blog and find all that and and put in comments what you like and what you uh have to say about it we'd love to read that so thanks everyone yeah this has been fun thank you for listening to the squirrel podcast for the distracted writer with candace j thomas and jody l milner Please like and subscribe to our podcast for updates and new episodes, and find more information at our website, squirrelpodcast.com. Stay distracted, everyone. Huh? A fence? A fence? I thought you said there was a fence you could go to. Events? Events! There are events? Yeah, that's my accent coming out. Not a fence, you weirdo.